Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Wistran and I'm the Deputy Director of the Kennan Institute. Thank you for joining us for a discussion of the fate of Russia's first federalization. Before I introduce our guest, I'd like to remind you that you can stay up to date on the Kennan Institute's activities by visiting our website and subscribing to our blogs, podcasts, and other publications. I'd also like to take a moment to thank the Department of State's Title VIII program for its generous support of several of the Kennan Institute's fellowships. These fellowships allow us to support rising scholars, such as today's guest, Dr. Marcel Garbosch. Dr. Marcel Garbosch is a historian of social and political thought in the late Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. Focus of Marcel's Title VIII fellowship was the international origins of federalist thought and politics in the Russian Empire. Marcel is currently a visiting assistant professor of Russian history at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. After our guest speaks, there will be a question and answer period. If you'd like to ask a question, please submit your question via the Q&A function on Zoom. And please remember to include your name and affiliation when doing so. Finally, today's discussion is being recorded. Marcel, please. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for the warm introduction. Uh, and also thanks to everybody at the Kennan Institute for supporting the research that went into the lecture for today. And of course, thank you everyone who's uh, joining online right now. I'll switch over to my PowerPoint uh, so that you can, let's see, view everything. And if you have any trouble viewing, you let me know. Jennifer, can you see everything on your end? Excellent, okay. Well, again, thank you everybody for, for joining us today. Um, I should start off by saying uh, when you read the title of today's lecture and you see the word Russia and federalization or federalism uh, in the same sentence, uh, probably a lot of you are thinking about uh, the Soviet model of ethnic federalism that prevailed across Northern Eurasia for almost seven decades in the 20th century, uh, or even uh, the post-Soviet uh, federal system under Putin, which uh, is also a very centralized form uh, of, of polity uh, overlaid with a federal model. Uh, a lot of the historians and scholars, uh, social scientists who talk about federalism in the context of Russian Soviet history uh, tend to emphasize a division or almost a rupture between the genuine uh, liberal democratic federalisms of the West and the so-called sham federalism of the Russian and Soviet context. Uh, what I want to do today is not to fundamentally challenge that uh, distinction, uh, but rather to introduce you to um, an attempt at federalizing the late Russian Empire uh, that actually brings into clearer focus the continuities between Western and Russian uh, federalist contexts, uh, and also shows uh, the circulation of ideas between the late Russian Empire and uh, the wider world. Now, when uh, Tsar Nicholas II abdicated uh, the Russian throne in March of 1917, a ferment of federalist thought and politics gathered momentum across the vast territory of the former Russian Empire. Within days or even weeks of the Tsar's abdication, uh, revolutionary journals and newspapers across the empire bristled with specific proposals for how to transform the old empire into a uh, federal republic, potentially along the lines of the United States, or more ambitiously, uh, the British Commonwealth, with its overseas dominions such as uh, Canada and Australia. By the summer of 1917, these initial proposals turned into conferences and congresses in which uh, different proponents of federalism from across the empire increasingly met with one another and built coalitions of, uh, across ethnic, ideological, and religious lines. Uh, they came up with specific ideas uh, for how to implement federalism on an all-imperial scale. And really, at this point, we see a lot of the federalists from the non-Russian borderlands, uh, in particular, present-day Ukraine, taking the initiative, while the provisional government in Petrograd uh, refused to make any definitive statements on Russia's future system of government until the election of a democratic constituent assembly. Uh, this federal project reached one, reached one of its culminations uh, in January of 1918, uh, when the Constituent Assembly finally convened for its one and only session, and a Russian uh, democratic federal republic was actually proclaimed uh, shortly before the Bolsheviks shuttered the Constituent Assembly and uh, embarked on their project of uh, ethno-federal state building. Uh, what I'll be talking to you, um, what I'll be talking about with you today is uh, really at one of those central conferences that happens uh, in the summer of 1917 uh, in Kiev, uh, when a lot of these uh, different federalist milieus converge and ultimately a, a draft program for a federal Russia uh, that's never implemented uh, actually gets drawn together. Uh, I call this a process of uh, federalization or Russia's first federalization uh, somewhat tentatively and uh, with some qualifications. Uh, 
it really was a piecemeal project that happened over a patchwork of different uh, emerging institutions of national autonomy. It was never an all-encompassing or ultimately a successful attempt at federalization, but it nevertheless marked one of the first uh, real efforts at realizing the principle of uh, the right of nations to self-determination through a federal system that would be neither czarist, of course, nor, nor uh, Soviet. One illustration of the spirit of this uh, federal moment, or this federalist ferment, as I've uh, described it, uh, is an article from uh, 1917 from the Russian socialist revolutionary journal Dela Naroda, uh, written by Yosef Okulich. Uh, and it was titled uh, simply, Russia, a Union of Regions. And the basic point of Okulich, uh, which gained a, a lot of momentum throughout Russia during these uh, months between the February and October revolutions, uh, before the civil war really deepened and, and the Bolsheviks and whites uh, quashed a lot of these attempts at federalization, uh, was that Russia really could uh, reform itself on the model of the United States and that the American revolutionary example of 1776 could now be replicated to some degree in Russia in 1917. Uh, this new Russian uh, state that Okulich uh, laid out would have a common set of uh, external borders, uh, tariff policy, a common currency, uh, a shared federal constitution, army, navy, and railroad administration. But all of the individual uh, constituent uh, regions of this uh, state would really have the right to control not only their internal cultural and educational policies, but also decide upon their uh, paths to industrialization and social development. And Okulich used the examples of Poland, as well as Georgia and the Caucasus, but his favorite example was Siberia. Uh, he said that Siberia, in relation to European Russia, was a colony uh, that needed to have uh, the right to mobilize its uh, native natural resources uh, without excessive involvement from uh, Moscow. Now, the reason that I found out about this text by Okulich and really got into this project uh, wasn't because I just found Okulich on his own. Uh, it's because Okulich is actually a footnote in the collective works of none other than Joseph Stalin. Uh, a few weeks after Okulich published, published this article in uh, March of 1917, uh, Stalin penned a reply, uh, categorically rejecting the idea that uh, Russia could be federalized. He said that already in 1917, the whole empire was becoming a united economic fabric, and that introducing federalism would simply erect barriers uh, to the integration of the different territories, and ultimately the uh, unification of the proletariat behind one uh, social democratic movement. Uh, and, and in that case, the uh, the Bolshevik uh, party. Uh, Stalin, uh, in this sense, uh, was in the minority, we could say at this time, uh, among sort of the, the socialists and left uh, milieus. Uh, Okulich's position was really widespread. Uh, but in most uh, histories, uh, really, the, the, the story of this uh, first federalization finds the same fate that Okulich's article found. It really becomes just a prelude or, or at best a footnote in the history of the formation of the Soviet system. Uh, this optimistic and ambitious attempt at creating a multinational state, uh, but one that ultimately disappeared as the Bolsheviks started to take control over the borderlands between 1918 and 1921. Uh, so in this sense, the history of this first federalization, if you want to call it that, from March of 1917 to about January of 1918, uh, usually appears as, as just a very brief uh, subplot or, or interlude uh, between czarism and uh, the triumph of uh, the Soviet model. But what I want to emphasize in today's lecture is that we should go back to the support abortive first federalization for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one, uh, we get to relativize the Soviet models of ethnic federalism and the specific Soviet programs for industrialization and multinational statehood by really looking at the more decentralized models that were circulating in the borderlands uh, that really called uh, not for a federal model uh, that would break from the Western examples, but that would synthesize uh, Western examples with uh, the, the peculiarities of, of Russia's uh, multi-ethnic composition. And in particular, we'll look at examples from Ukraine. Uh, that's what I'll focus on primarily today. Uh, the other important point, uh, which is a bit uh, longer in terms of its uh, geographical focus, uh, is that we get to think about uh, the imperial Russian space and its intellectual development, and specifically the development of federalism in the context of global patterns of uh, the circulation of ideas. And I'll be focusing today mainly on 1917, uh, but to give you a sense of the longer trajectory uh, in, into which this lecture fits, uh, there was an initial period, uh, we can say, in the 19th century, but especially during Russia's industrialization starting in the 1890s, uh, when these uh, thinkers who are active in 1917 are actually traveling abroad to Germany, even to the British Empire or the United States, uh, more often reading about those parts of the world and imaginatively traveling there. Uh, and they're trying to come up with ways of um, uh, modeling a future Russian federation on systems that are already out there in the world. 
Uh, so in that sense, they're really importing and absorbing, uh, absorbing ideas from more industrially developed uh, federations really up to the beginning of 1917. Uh, where that starts to turn into something more interesting, I think, uh, is that during 1917, during the revolutions and afterward, when these federalists are dispersed into exile uh, during the civil wars, they begin to think that Russia is not just a country that should absorb the foreign models, but that it's actually becoming a laboratory for a unique kind of multinational uh, federalism uh, based on self-determination that can be exported to other empires like Austria-Hungary uh, or the Ottoman Empire, or even more ambitiously, uh, the colonial empires of uh, Western European countries. And I put 1953, the death of Stalin, uh, as the, the end date, uh, because a lot of these exiled federalists uh, are active not just in the interwar period, but they also actually go to the United States and to Britain during the Cold War and advise governments on the nationalities policies of the Soviet Union. Now, the high point of this federalist ferment in, uh, this, in the summer of 1917, for me at least, is this Congress of the Enslaved Nations of Russia that takes place for about a week in uh, Kiev at its pedagogical museum, uh, which was the center of the uh, work of the Ukrainian Central Rada. This was a self-proclaimed institution of uh, Ukrainian national autonomy that formed in the early days uh, after the February Revolution. Uh, and that was led by its first president, uh, Mikhail Khrushchevsky, a populist historian and a moderate member of the, Russia, the Ukrainian party of socialist revolutionaries. And uh, during its, its uh, earliest uh, days of activity, uh, the Central Rada was calling uh, for an uh, autonomous Ukraine, uh, with broad political and economic self-rule within a federal Russia. Uh, but as the summer, uh, as, as the spring turned into summer, the Central Rada's uh, leaders began to reach out to uh, the heads of other institutions of national autonomy in the Baltic region, uh, in Belarus, also in the Caucasus, and even in places like uh, Central Asia, Siberia, and the Far East, uh, encouraging them to come to Kiev for a future Congress to draft a plan for the federalization of the entire uh, Russian Empire. And uh, this is significant, of course, because from the very beginning, even though we think of the revolution, the February Revolution is starting in Petrograd, uh, the leading cadet party in the provisional government, uh, read by Prince uh, Georgi Lvov, uh, were very uh, hostile to the idea of decentralization along Khrushchevsky's model. They wanted to keep the, the former empire together as much as possible to win World War I, uh, but also they believed, and this is Lvov's uh, statement, uh, that Russia was already becoming quite integrated as uh, an economic space and that federalizing it would break it apart. Uh, so similar to the logic behind uh, Stalin's critique, though coming from more of a liberal constitutional uh, point of view than, than a, a, a radical Bolshevik one. Uh, Lvov uh, and, and Khrushchevsky are engaged in this struggle uh, really throughout 1917, especially the early part, uh, over federalization in which the provisional government refuses to take uh, any uh, major actions. Now, if the, uh, the Constitutional Democrats and Lvov were uh, really uh, not, not willing to engage in this project with Khrushchevsky, you would think maybe that Khrushchevsky and the Central Rada would find uh, greater allies among the Russian Party of Socialist Revolutionaries. Again, a separate grouping from the Ukrainian one. Uh, the Ukrainian one only emerges in 1917. The Russian one had been there since about 1900, uh, 1901. And the Russian SRs uh, were indeed uh, strong proponents of federalism. Uh, from the time of the party's foundation, uh, around 1900, uh, its first ideological uh, leader, uh, Viktor Chernov, uh, was uh, really stridently advocating Russia's uh, transformation into not just a democratic state, but a, a federal one. And the idea of the socialist revolutionaries was that uh, Russia could be uh, almost a, a patchwork of self-governing communes of the workers and peasants, and those would be grouped into larger national or, or ethnic units. And uh, Chernov especially wanted to give uh, some parody to Ukraine or Poland uh, and the Caucasus. Uh, and the idea is that the ethnically Ukrainian territory, ethnically Russian territories would uh, form one of these, these constituent uh, federal units. Uh, the, the somewhat younger generation with Mark Vishniak and Nadezhda Zavrilova Shaspolskaya, who were very active um, first around the time of 1905 and then especially in 1917, uh, they actually drafted specific programs for uh, implementing models from the United States or the British Empire, uh, even Germany for that matter, or Switzerland uh, in the Russian case. And their main argument throughout 1917 uh, was that federalization was necessary on one hand to win the war, to mobilize Russia's uh, productive energies against the central powers, uh, and also over the long term to allow the different nationalities to pursue their own autonomous paths to social development. And the idea here, which is different from the Bolshevik or even the Menshevik model, which envisioned a socialist revolution on the scale of the whole of Russia, uh, the SRs uh, really did think that the different uh, regions of Russia could pursue their own paths, whether to reform a revolution or something else. It wasn't something that had to happen across the whole empire all at the same time. 
The challenge, though, uh, in the relations between the Russian SRs and the uh, Ukrainians uh, was that even when the Russian SRs gained uh, a great deal of momentum uh, in, the, in the Soviets and the workers, peasants, and, and soldiers' committees, uh, and also in the provisional government, uh, they were still bound to this uh, obligation not to make any decisive changes uh, to the state structure of Russia until the Constituent Assembly could be convened. So in Petrograd, where they had their base and their center, uh, they refused to implement uh, federalism, despite the fact that it was uh, supported by a lot of the institutions of national autonomy in the borderlands. Uh, the Ukrainians in this case, uh, though, were the ones who were really pushing for that federalization and were actually implementing federal structures within their autonomous Ukrainian government uh, in, in the spring and summer uh, of 1917. Uh, really, uh, the main point for, for people like uh, Mykola Porsh or Vladimir Vinichenko, who were Ukrainian uh, social democrats, uh, was that uh, as industrialization developed in the Russian Empire, it actually produced not one all-Russian economy, uh, but many different uh, crystallized regional units that needed to be managed uh, individually, even if they would be coordinated very loosely at the federal level. And for this reason, they were attracted to the model of the United States or the uh, British model of the, uh, the Commonwealth. Uh, and especially um, the, the Ukrainians were calling for an even looser federal model than what the Russian SRs uh, would have allowed. And this was central to the, the programs of the Ukrainian Social Democrats and also the Socialist Revolutionaries uh, in 1905 and 1917. Uh, Khrushchevsky, on the, on the other hand, is, is uh, going even further, uh, arguing really that Ukraine has to be uh, nearly an independent state. There should be really a very minimalist federal government that manages maybe foreign policy, uh, something in terms of having a common currency. But Ukraine should even have its own, own army and, and really its own uh, industrial policy. Uh, Khrushchevsky was drawn not just to the British model, but also to the American, Brazilian, uh, and, and uh, uh, to a lesser extent, German models. Uh, so the general point of the Ukrainian SRs and, and, and social democrats uh, was that uh, national and economic oppression went hand in hand. In their view, it was the propertied classes of the Russian center in Moscow and Petrograd who were organizing the Russian empire's industrial policy uh, for their own benefit uh, at the expense of places like Ukraine. And they believed uh, that uh, it's really necessary for every nationality, uh, with every nationality having its own mode of production and its own culture, uh, really to have autonomy in both cultural and, and economic uh, affairs. And Hrushevsky, when he's addressing this Congress in uh, Kiev in September of 1917, he has a great moment where he says that the Ukrainian Cossack Hetmanate became part of uh, the Russian state uh, through this union of Pereyaslav back in 1654, and that was a, a voluntary union. And he's saying that the future of Ukraine lies not in independent statehood, but in regaining that autonomy and reworking Russia into a federal model. Uh, and Khrushchevsky makes the point very emphatically that Ukraine cannot survive as an autonomous unit within Russia unless all of the other nationalities enjoy pretty much equal rights as uh, members of this federation. And uh, the Rada's policies under Khrushchevsky's leadership in 1917 include declaring Ukrainian territorial autonomy uh, initially in the gubernias or the regions around the Dnipro River, but then further south uh, into the northern coast of the Black Sea and even Crimea, uh, while also creating structures of extraterritorial autonomy for the Jewish, Russian, and Polish nationalities, and really any nationality that can get more than 10,000 signatures on a petition uh, within the Ukrainian uh, autonomy. Uh, so that's a kind of a nested structure, territorial autonomy for Ukrainians and extraterritorial national personal autonomy uh, for the smaller groups within. Now, when Khrushchevsky puts out this call to the other borderland authorities uh, and the other uh, uh, proponents of decentralization and autonomy, it actually gets uh, quite, quite a, a large, um, a, a good deal of, of um, support. Uh, the areas that are marked with these dark green, uh, these white circles with the dark green outlines, uh, those are the areas that actually sent uh, delegations to Kiev in September of 1917. Uh, the pale green ones are, are areas that sent uh, good wishes or that acknowledged the work of the, uh, the Congress without actually sending delegations, usually because of logistical purposes. And I'll put the, the full list of the nationalities on the next slide. Uh, but it's not only uh, the Russian SRs who are sending their delegation, but also social democrats from Estonia and Latvia, uh, Polish socialists, uh, Belarusian socialist revolutionaries, even Jewish Zionists and people from uh, some of the more Jewish national parties are attending. Uh, Cossacks from many different military hosts are, are going to Kiev. Uh, Romanian and Moldovan uh, representatives, as well as uh, those from Georgia, present day Azerbaijan, uh, parts of uh, Tatarstan, as well as uh, Central Asia are all sending their delegations. And altogether, it really is a long list of, of different nationalities that are represented, and also many different uh, ideological tendencies. 
uh, at this Congress in Kiev over that, that week in September, uh, you have um, about half of the delegates coming from social democratic or socialist revolutionary parties, uh, but there are also many that are more moderate and centrist, uh, even some that are more to the right, like the Azeri Musavadis, uh, who are more national liberals uh, than anything. Uh, so this actually brings together a surprisingly broad uh, uh, spectrum of different nationalities and different political parties. Over the course of that week, because we had so many delegations coming to Kiev and meeting, uh, a lot of the time is actually spent uh, with just the individual delegations giving reports on what's going on in their different territories. But ultimately, uh, under the leadership of Khrushchevsky and the Ukrainians, the Congress uh, adopts a, a series of resolutions on the future federal structure of Russia. Uh, Khrushchevsky calls it this, uh, he calls it a palace of nations. It's almost an alternative to what Lenin would call the prison of nations. Um, this is definitely heavily influenced by the Ukrainians, but it is signed off by pretty much all of the delegations, except for the Polish and Lithuanian ones. Uh, the Poles at that point, Poland was under uh, the, the uh, rule of the, the central powers by 1917. Uh, the Lithuanians were already gaining some kind of independence under uh, German influence. Uh, so those two delegations didn't opt for federalism. Uh, they abstained, but all of the others actually affixed their, their names and signatures to this uh, set of resolutions. And some of the most important points from this that I'll just enumerate quickly, uh, the, the idea, again, along the, the model set by Khrushchevsky, is that Russia would become a federal republic consisting of many different autonomous national territories. In theory, you would have a federal government in Petrograd that would have um, the, some, some say or maybe, maybe the final say in for, uh, foreign policy, uh, some of the monetary or, or, or uh, currency-based uh, policies, uh, but really the different regions would, would uh, control their own economic and cultural affairs. Uh, and then again, you would have these non-territorial assemblies of the different smaller minorities nested within the territories, meaning that if you were a Jew living in Ukraine, whether you're living in Poltava or Kiev or Odessa, you would have um, an assembly uh, that is uh, meeting maybe in Kiev one year, maybe in Odessa next year, in which all of the Jews, irrespective of their uh, place of residence, would, would send delegations. Uh, and the idea is that this would allow for cultural and educational autonomy for the smaller nationalities. Uh, each of these individual uh, autonomous national territories in the view of this resolution passed on the 28th of September, 1917, uh, is that they would all have their own constituent assemblies that would be chosen by popular universal uh, suffrage. Uh, there would be, of course, the constituent assemblies still in Petrograd, uh, but the constituent nationalities could form their own uh, legislatures. And a really important part of this is that Kiev, in theory, would be the seat of a so-called uh, Rada Narodiv, or Council of Peoples, that would oversee the process of federalization, because this couldn't be done just from one, one day to the next. It would be a, a long-term process. And then it would be a permanent fixture within the federation that would make sure that the central authorities are not abusing the autonomy of the different nationalities. So in a sense, that tension between Petrograd, Petrograd and Kiev would be uh, almost uh, incorporated into the structure of this federal state, with Kiev having this regulatory or supervisory role. But the most important point about these declarations is that they didn't uh, just stop at what would happen within Russia's borders. They have very broad international uh, goals. Uh, re really, the point in, in 1917 is that Russia is having not just a social revolution, but also a, a, a turn to federalism. And that this uh, model of social and, and political change would be one uh, that would guide similar movements in other empires. Uh, as I said before, maybe Austria-Hungary or the Ottoman Empire would be the big examples. Uh, the, the general idea, too, was that uh, by federalizing the military and by putting individual military units under the national authorities, that would draw greater popular support to an increasingly unpopular war and would actually allow Russia to win. The point of winning, though, was not just to have a geopolitical victory over the central powers, but that at a future peace conference, uh, the Russian delegation would theoretically push very aggressively to make sure that the right of nations to self-determination is on the agenda of the peace conference and that it's respected in all parts uh, of, of the post-war world, uh, particularly in Europe and parts of Eurasia, maybe not so much in, in Africa or other regions, but at least a, a good part of the world uh, in and around uh, Russia. And I find this significant because it's happening before Woodrow Wilson adopts his 14 points in January of 1918, uh, and also before Vladimir Lenin uh, at, at the P at Treaty of uh, Brest-Litovsk, together with uh, Leon Trotsky, uh, are also trying to spread the right of nations to self-determination uh, as a way of expanding the reach of the revolution. Uh, so this idea is already being drafted and uh, really elevated uh, to the all-Russian stage and ideally to the international stage. And the general point that they, they use when they talk about enslaved nations, uh, the idea is generally that uh, you can have uh, multinational or multi-ethnic states created from the former territory of empires. Uh, 
uh, without fragmenting those states into just a patchwork of individual nation states, and that you can actually reconcile cooperation within multinational states with the principle of self-determination in an economic and, and cultural sense. And just to give you a sense of where this goes later on, uh, the, the Congress uh, ends in, in, in late September, the different delegations go back to their home regions. Um, but the, the main point is, is that uh, they don't convene again uh, later in 1917. Uh, the Bolsheviks launched the October Revolution. The civil wars begin to deepen by the end of 1917, early 1918. And the one glimpse that we get into this federalization maybe actually being passed into law is at the, the first meeting of the Constituent Assembly. And you can see on this map, the green areas generally voted for the Russian SRs, the gold and yellow areas voted for the Ukrainian SRs, and the pink areas in the top left area uh, tended to vote for the Bolsheviks. Um, the, the SRs, both Ukrainian and, and Russian, they form the largest uh, group within the, the Constituent Assembly. And very briefly, it's the last order of business on the agenda uh, before they get shuttered by the Bolsheviks in, in January of 1918. Uh, they uh, resolve that Russia, that the empire must be uh, transformed into a federative democratic republic. Now, it's ultimately not the SRs who carry that out in practice, but the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks at the Third Congress of Soviets, not even a week later, uh, actually appropriate the federal model in a bid to gain legitimacy and some support in the, the non-Russian borderlands and to make the, the Bolshevik expansion into the borderlands look less like the resurrection of the empire and more like the creation of a, a fraternity of different nations. Uh, Joseph Stalin and also Vladimir Lenin are the ones who frame this idea uh, that the uh, Russian um, uh, Federative uh, Republic, this uh, Soviet Federative uh, Socialist Republic uh, that endures uh, up until 1991, uh, should be a federation of different smaller national units rather than uh, officially a unitary state. Uh, in practice, of course, it is unitary. The Soviet Union is very centralized economically and politically. Uh, the outlying borderlands do get more cultural and uh, educational autonomy, definitely in the 1920s. Uh, but it, it isn't really a, a federal project based on true decentralization in the way that the Federalists of, of 1917 wanted it to work. It is the one that survives at, uh, at the end of the day, though, and the one that we know the best. And just to wrap this up, though, um, I don't want to, to end the story just in January of 1918 with the Bolsheviks closing down the Constituent Assembly and taking the idea for themselves. Uh, because that, you know, when you when you end there, what you see is Ukraine, some of the Caucasian countries, the Central Asian uh, areas, beginning to declare independence as a way of surviving as the the civil war is getting worse. Uh, but what I want to emphasize and, and for you to, to all consider as we as we wrap up, is that all of these people who are active uh, at the uh, the Congress in, in September of, of 1917, uh, they continue uh, federalist and also internationalist projects into the interwar period and even into the Cold War. Uh, some of them, uh, these uh, members of the, the independent Ukrainian Communist Party, uh, founded in part by Volodymyr Vinyachenko, uh, they actually stay in the Soviet Union into the early to mid-1920s. They try to actually argue for Ukraine's uh, genuine uh, independence or, or um, rather autonomy within the Soviet structure. But it becomes very clear that the Bolsheviks aren't willing to tolerate the degree of self-rule that the Ukrainian uh, communists want. And they're ultimately pushed out, and it's the Ukrainian Bolsheviks uh, who set up their government in, in, in Kharkiv. Uh, but some of these people from the Kiev conference, especially the left, left-leaning SRs and, and social democrats, uh, do actually stay in the Soviet Union and try to carve out uh, a true federation. Many of them, though, end up in European exile. These two figures, Viktor Chernov and Mark Vishniak, uh, they go to places like Berlin, London, and Paris, uh, where they actually uh, try to, to petition the League of Nations uh, to, to weaken the position of the Soviet Union. Uh, but Vishniak in particular also tries to uh, organize ideas for international federalism, for ideas about disarmament and, and uh, almost pacifism among different countries. Uh, Chernov, for his part, uh, still tries to organize Ukrainian and Armenian uh, exiles uh, in Prague, where he's based. And uh, some of the SRs hold on to the idea that if the Soviet system collapses uh, quite soon in the 20s and 30s, that uh, basically the, the Federalists of 1917 should go back to what they were working on and try to keep the former imperial territory uh, together as a federation. Uh, others uh, like Chernov are willing to, to accept the independence of the Ukrainians or other groups and uh, to have sort of a loose uh, confederation, maybe of different uh, nationalities. Uh, another important point though for the SRs, uh, both Russian and Ukrainian, as well as for the more moderate social Democrats, uh, Georgian, Russian, Ukrainian, uh, some of the Armenian socialists, uh, they joined an organization in the 1920s called the Labor and Socialist International, which is a more moderate social democratic alternative to the Bolshevik Communist International. Uh, 
uh, that's led by the uh, German Social Democrats and the British Labour Party. And they also think about ideas for global and European federalism or cooperation among nations uh, within this uh, model of uh, really pacifism and, and disarmament. Another group, though, who are more interested in war and in violent upheaval uh, would be groups like the Prometheans. Uh, these are emigres or exiles from Ukraine, the Caucasus, Central Asia, the Volga region, the Tatar regions, uh, even uh, Siberia and, and the Far East, who look for state patrons in places like Poland, Germany, Turkey, and Japan, uh, who are trying to find ways of undermining the Soviet Union militarily. And their idea is no longer about federalizing the former territory as much as it's about creating an alliance of the borderland nationalities against the ethnically Russian center and breaking apart the Soviet Union and creating a belt, a kind of a confederal belt, uh, mainly a military alliance of the different nationalities. Uh, so if the, the federalists, uh, Ukrainian or Polish in, in uh, 1917, were really open to the idea of sharing a common state with the ethnic Russians, as a result of the civil war, they begin to come to the conclusion, in their view, that Bolshevism is a product of Russian collectivism and traditions of Russian despotism uh, that weren't really reforming themselves in the course of the revolution. So the borderlands can only survive by physically breaking away and encircling uh, the Russian center. And this is a Polish map from the 1930s that is actually put together by Prometheans who come from Georgia, Azerbaijan, the Volga region, and Ukraine especially, uh, as well as the, the uh, Crimean Tatars. And in this sense, uh, what I want to emphasize is that even though a lot of these autonomists and federalists end up seceding in 1918 and forming their own uh, independent countries, they don't give up on ideas of internationalist cooperation, but they do reconfigure them pretty dramatically as their networks are being dispersed around the world and they're looking for patrons in new states. And I'll be happy to talk about that more if you're interested in it. So just some concluding thoughts because we're coming up right on uh, 30 minutes. Um, what I want to emphasize in general is that we might think of this first federalization, this attempt at federalization, as uneven and incomplete as it was, as not just a prelude to the Soviet system or an interlude between czarism and the Soviet Union, but as something of an inflection point. Up until 1917, all of these federal ideas had been circulating between Russia and the wider world, and the people who participated in the conference actually brought them to Russia and tried to map them onto the Russian uh, reality. Uh, and it's an inflection point as well, because after this uh, very fragile experiment of 1917 is destroyed in the course of the civil wars, uh, it doesn't just end there. It goes into exile and the networks get reconfigured and moved to other parts uh, of the world. Uh, the other important point, again, is uh, that these networks converge in Kiev. That's a concrete example, a place where these uh, federalists and autonomists come together of their own free will and try to come up with a common program for all of Russia. So we can think of these people kind of as a cohort, um, a cohort that tells us something about how people thought about uh, reorganizing the imperial space at this time. And the last point that I'll leave you with is just that we want to think about late imperial Russia and its overseas exile networks as part of a bigger ecology of federalist thought in the 19th and 20th centuries, rather than just an area walled off uh, in the time of the Soviet Union. Those are the last points. Uh, again, I appreciate you uh, uh, listening, and I am, I'm looking forward to the discussion. So thank you. and. Uh, Thank you, Jennifer, for that, too. I'll uh, switch back to my camera, and I'll mute myself oh. so you can speak. That was excellent. Thank you, Marcel. That was just such a detailed, thorough presentation. Um, we are going to open the floor to questions. Just as a reminder, um, please submit your questions via the, the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and please do remember to include your name. An affiliation. While the questions are populating, maybe Marcel, I'll, I'll start by asking you a question and maybe picking up on that last point you made. I am curious, can you talk a little bit more about kind of how the, these groups, you know, kind of went into exile or where they went or were some of the ideas appropriated by certain states that you found? I'm just kind of curious about the residual vestiges. Sure. So, so the, um, yeah, the exile and what happens afterward, um, uh, because uh, Poland especially is right on the Western border of what becomes the Soviet Union. Uh, even the, the exiles who are going from the Caucasus or Ukraine to Germany or France, a lot of the time go through Poland. Uh, so Poland becomes almost um, an alternative successor state to the, to the um, Soviet Union, you know, from the, the legacy of the Russian empire. Um, what I've studied a lot in my own work is um, in Warsaw, especially, and also in Vilnius in present day Lithuania, uh, there's uh, already a, a population of uh, Georgians and some Tatars living there from the time of the Russian Empire, because people would resettle between the different regions. Uh, the Polish, um, the, the Tatars, the Lipka Tatars, who lived between Poland, Belarus, and Lithuania, they married often with Crimean and Volga Tatars, 
So that actually was a familial network that brought some of those Tatar federalists into the Promethean movement. Um, the others who go to Paris, uh, Noy Jordania and uh, Noy Ramashvili, who are Georgian Mensheviks, uh, they also have a connection to Poland because Jordania actually, I think he studied uh, veterinary medicine there for a while. Uh, so even within the Russian Empire before 1914, people are moving around the different borderlands with people who are educated and who have some money. Uh, so Poland becomes a magnet in that sense uh, because it already has some legacy within the Russian imperial space. Uh, the other example is Japan, though, for a lot of the Far Eastern nationalities, for the Buryats, uh, for the Yakut, uh, uh, sort of anti-Bolshevik uh, nationalists. Uh, many of them do go to Tokyo or to um, Harbin in Manchuria. And the Polish military intelligence staff tries to create a network between Paris, Helsinki, and uh, Finland, where some of the Ingrian or the Finnish uh, and the Estonian groups go, um, uh, between Poland itself, then with Turkey and also uh, Man Manchuria and the Far East. Um, so it is, it is uh, the, the Polish government actively seeking them out as well and giving them uh, money and funding to come to those places. That's fascinating, especially the mention about the Far East. That's absolutely fascinating. All right, we have a number of questions that are coming up. So I will start with the first from Alexei Varov. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that if the October Revolution didn't take place, there could be further room for discussion and compromise between the provisional government and the central Rada? It's it's an excellent question. Um, I think, uh, judge on, judging from what was happening in the Constituent Assembly in uh, January of 1918, uh, they would have at least had a basis for a conversation about creating a federation. I do think, though, that the uh, the Ukrainians wanted an even more decentralized structure than what the, the Russian SRs uh, probably would have preferred, uh, because the Russian SRs did want to keep uh, some element of economic or military integration, whereas the Ukrainians really wanted to decentralize it uh, uh, very dramatically. So I think uh, it would be a process. It would probably take a long time for them to work out the actual, uh, the groundwork in, in, in theory. But they were very much on the same page, I think, by, by, by the end of 1917, 1918. Yeah, excellent. Uh, next question from Michael mm -hmm. Keyes. Excellent presentation. Can you give us some sense of the Bolshevik game playing in the run-up to the Constituent Assembly meeting, meeting that we're meant to sabotage it and what Lenin and the Bolsheviks did at the Constituent Assembly. Yes, so so um, when uh, the Bolsheviks originally launched the October Revolution, they were saying that this is the, the proletarian socialist revolution that's eclipsing the bourgeois democratic uh, revolution from uh, February or March uh, with the, with the uh, provisional government. Uh, the Bolsheviks um, choose to participate in the, the first meeting of the Constituent uh, Assembly uh, primarily, uh, you know, because they're, they're running in the elections at that point, and they do get about a quarter of the popular vote. Uh, much of it is sort of in the industrial region around Moscow and, and uh, uh, Petrograd. Uh, but it's very clear from the beginning that they resent the Constituent Assembly and consider it to be a bourgeois democratic uh, kind of a, a, a counter-revolutionary institution. Uh, so they don't really have in, uh, uh, any intention of being part of it over the long term. Um, the, the way that it ends, the Constituent Assembly meeting goes all the way until like 4 a.m., the, the, the day after it, it begins. And uh, the, one of the guards, who is a Bolshevik settler, uh, says, uh, Karaul Ustal, the, the guard is tired. So they shudder it for the night, meaning to come back the next day. But when it comes to the next uh, the day, the Bolsheviks uh, refuse to, to allow it to, to happen. Uh, and I think the reason for that also is uh, the Bolsheviks at the Constituent Assembly would heckle the socialist revolutionaries. They would call them uh, counter-revolutionary and really say that uh, they're just participating there as, as a way of um, almost taking advantage of the divisions uh, within the Constituent Assembly. Uh, so they didn't really have a long-term intention of staying there. It was more to participate in the elections uh, to the Constituent Assembly to get a base of popular support and then to move to an only, like a Soviet-only uh, system without the Constituent Assembly. Excellent. Um, next question uh, from Megan Dixon. Could you talk about economic self-determination and how that was understood as connected to, quote, nationalities? Definitely. So the, the thing that I would contrast it with um, is that when the Bolsheviks uh, were talking about self-determination, they were saying that nationalism and modern national identities are really just um, an incidental feature of capitalist development. Uh, Lenin was never really promoting national independence or even federalization. He was very much in, in, in favor of a centralized system. Um, the contrast to this, and, and, and of course the Bolsheviks were saying this because they argued that as industrial capitalism develops, it's welding all of Russia together into one uh, coherent unit. The socialist revolutionaries, uh, both Russian and Ukrainian, took a different view. They said that really uh, every different uh, nationality, 
has its own mode of production grounded in its unique way of cultivating the land and sort of organizing itself into family units and also into to communes in some cases. So they said that, for instance, the Ukrainian peasants have a more individualized uh, system of land tenure, whereas the Russian peasants around Moscow have a more communal one. And I saw this not as something that had to be reconciled. They weren't saying that one mode of production has to prevail everywhere, but they're actually saying that industrialization diversifies uh, and creates different regional and national uh, paths. Uh, so in their view, uh, cultural and, and economic uh, autonomy go hand in hand because the, the folk culture of the peasants especially is something that has a direct influence on, on uh, the uh, material culture and also the material culture on the, the folk culture. Uh, so they're saying that uh, there isn't really one unified capitalist economy. It really is a patchwork. Uh, and the peasants are the ones who are the bearers really of each, each nation. Well, thank you. Um, next question. We're getting quite a few questions here uh, yeah. from Vivian Korsus. How did the activities in 1917 Russia manifest in Alaska during that time? In Alaska during that time? That, that, that is... Um... Mm -hmm. An interesting point. I mean, I think Alaska, the, U, the U.S. purchased it, right, in, in 1867. I do wonder about the, the Russians who were still in Alaska then and what they would have known about the revolution. This is a very good question because uh, you do have still some Russian like descendants of the settlers. Uh, the one thing I can tell you is that if you go to the east of the Urals, uh, a lot of the, the Russian socialist revolutionaries in Siberia and the Far East would emphasize that those parts of Asian Russia were distinct from European Russia that historically the people who moved there were escaping serfdom and becoming more of the you know, kind of individual farmers or proprietors, whereas the people in the European part are more collectivist. Uh, so I don't know about Alaska itself, and actually I now wanna read about it, uh, but I know at least the ones who are in Siberia and the Far East emphasized a distinctive regional identity that I imagine might also be, be there as well. Great, that, um, mm -hmm. let's see, yeah, no, we're getting a lot yeah. of questions here. Next yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, then Lushing, um, how much contact did these Federalists in the Russian Empire have with Federalists in the Austro-Hungarian Empire before the collapse of the empires from Northwestern this, University? Excellent. Thank you, yeah, Danilo, for that. Uh, so with Khrushchevsky, it's, it's relatively clear, right, because he actually goes to Lviv to, to lecture and to, to teach as a, as a professor. Um, I think in, in, in that sense, uh, the Ukrainian uh, the Ukrainian population having some constitutional freedoms within Galicia uh, was was an important precedent. I think, um, so there are kind of two answers uh, that, that, that I can mention. So on one hand, uh, somebody like uh, Mikola Porsche would say that the autonomy of Galicia, of this region in the northeastern part of Austria-Hungary, it's not true autonomy because it's basically just the Polish landowners and capitalists who are controlling the, the diet and who are controlling uh, all of the industries in, in the country. So they're actually saying that the Ukrainians and Austria-Hungary might have constitutional autonomy, but they don't have real, real national uh, freedom. Uh, the other important point is with Austro-Marxism, with Otto Bauer, Karl Renner, the theorists of the extraterritorial autonomy, that's very influential for the Ukrainians, especially in the Rada in 1917, because their idea is that you should have a Ukrainian territory within the ethnographic boundaries, where the Ukrainians are the majority of the peasant population. But what do you do with the Jews and the Russians and the Poles and the other groups? So their solution was actually not to carve out Polish or Russian or Jewish regions, but actually to create one uh, kind of assembly at the level of the whole Ukrainian territory to which all of the Jews and Poles and Russians would, would uh, send their, their delegates. Uh, so in that sense, they actually tried to decouple nationality from territory for the smaller minorities within Ukraine. And that was an idea that was directly taken from the pages of the Austrian uh, Marxists, I would say. So that's probably the most important uh, connection. Excellent. Um, next question from Dana Ayer. I'm not a Russian historian, but a sociologist concerned with current conflict dynamics. How well known, accessible is this history within current Russian, Ukrainian, other regions' historical memory? It, it's an excellent question. Um, there, there was a map I was going to include that came out uh, probably 2022 when the full scale invasion of Ukraine was beginning. And this was created by uh, Russian sort of anti Putin. Um, uh, exiles, as well as Ukrainians who had moved to Poland and Belarusians who were uh, gathering in Poland yet again to come up with an idea of what to do with, with Russia. And they have this map in which uh, the area with the actual Russian flag, the tricolor, is a little chunk around Moscow. Everything else, all of the different national republics, as well as Siberia, the Far East, the Arctic region, are marked as distinct uh, territories from Moscow or from Muscovy. And I think with the, with the Ukrainians today, especially, and with the exiles from Russia and Belarus, uh, they are emphasizing that actually Muscovite political culture did not encompass all of 
present day Russia originally. It started from the, the Grand Duchy of Muscovy and it spread out in the time of Ivan the Terrible and also the, the later Russian Tsars. And that Northern regions like Novgorod, uh, areas like Siberia and the Far East were quite distinct from uh, Central European Russia. Uh, so I see that map and it immediately reminds me of the Promethean map from the 1930s about uh, breaking up Russia into many different constituent regions. So that's absolutely alive in their minds. Uh, I would say in general though, with the with the Ukrainian sort of national historiography, there's a lot of pride in Khrushchevsky and in the Rada as being an alternative from both alternative to both both the Tsarism and uh, the Soviet model. So I think it's really making a comeback today as people are thinking about what might happen with Russia in the event that it begins to, to fragment or fall apart. Um, with the SRs, uh, I do know some, some Russian historians who are really interested in that, but I don't know how much it interests the general population uh, right now. Uh, but definitely in Ukraine, I would say. It's, it's a huge part of the memory. Great. Uh, we, yeah, lots of, your topic has generated a lot of questions. Next sure. one is from, says, uh, I'm Ron Bookbinder, a retiree interested in this topic. Thanks for your fascinating presentation. A few questions. Mm -hmm. so he's got three questions here. Um, one, I noticed that there were no Armenians in Kiev Congress. Why? Uh, number two, I see the Kiev Congress adopted the Austro-Marxist personality principle. Any thoughts on that? And number three, tell us about your book project and when we might expect it. So th thank you for these, these excellent questions. Um, about the Armenians, it's a question I have too. I know that the Central Rada sent um, an invitation to, to the Armenian, to the, to the Revolutionary Union. Uh, I believe that the Armenians expressed interest, uh, but there might have been logistical reasons. I don't know if it was related to the war at that time with the, the front running through the Caucasus. Uh, that is a good question. What I will say, though, is that the Armenians do, they stay out of the Promethean movement later in the 20s and 30s, mainly because the Azeri element, which is very pro-Turkish and, and, and Kemalist, is already there. Uh, so they don't want to be part of the same project. Um, but... Uh, Nevertheless, there is this project for the, the Transcaucasian Confederation in uh, 1918. That's very short-lived between uh, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and, and part of the North Caucasus. Uh, so I'll have to read more about why they didn't actually send people uh, there. But uh, they definitely were part of it. And uh, Hurry Barbarian has this great book. Um, uh, Barbarian has this book, uh, Roving Revolutionaries, which is about the Armenians traveling to uh, between Iran, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire in, in the early uh, late 19th, early 20th century, that, that for me is really important. So I will address that um, in, in the project later on. Uh, the point about Austro-Marxism, absolutely. The, the Ukrainians are taking that model because they uh, want to have Ukrainian territorial autonomy, but they're very cautious about carving out a, a separate territory for the Poles uh, in, in, in Western Ukraine or for the Russians, like in the Donbass, which were or in Crimea, which is what we're seeing happening right now. So they're trying to disarm really the the potentially fractious uh, consequences of, of, of giving territorial autonomy to those groups. And it is a way of uh, addressing the Jewish issue across the, the Russian empire. It does become uh, kind of contentious though, because a lot of the Jewish uh, delegates want to have an all Russian Jewish assembly in addition to the ones just within the individual units, uh, the territorial units. So they don't totally work it out, but they're trying at least to, to balance these uh, models. and. There's one important moment at a co Congress that happens in 1907 that the Russian SRs hold when the Jewish delegates actually say everybody should do uh, extraterritorial autonomy. There should be no national territorial units. Uh, we should basically just have um, some uh, gubernias or provinces and then the nationalities should all have extraterritorial assemblies that meet in one city from year to year. Uh, that doesn't succeed ultimately because the Ukrainians and Russians see the relationship between territory and production is being very, very close. Uh, about the book, well, I'm starting a fellowship in Scotland beginning of next year. That's for three years, and the goal is to have uh, a few articles and hopefully the manuscript uh, finished by the end of that. Uh, so I'm working on it, and I have a lot more to read, but uh, definitely have a foundation already. So hopefully uh, ne next next three years, the manuscript will be done. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next question from says, Hello, it's Jennifer Brush, former chief of the OSC mission in Moldova. Mm -hmm. Russian Transnistrian negotiators tried to push a, quote, federal solution to the Transnistrian conflict. Moldovans rejected any federalism out of hand. Mm -hmm. What is the legacy of federalism in current political thinking? Is it considered a slippery slope to secession? Ukrainians were big proponents while under Russian rule, not so mm -hmm. much now. It's, it's a very good question. Um, and the, the Transnistrian example is, is uh, 
is interesting. Uh, I think the big difference in 1917 is that you have a party like the Russian SRs who are not only popular with the Russian peasants, but also really have no intention of trying to hold on to the areas uh, the, of the borderlands that are non-Russian using any force. Uh, they're willing to let the Ukrainians secede if that's something that they want to do. Uh, so I think that back then, the people in the borderlands who wanted federalism had uh, uh, good interlocutors in the form of the Russian SRs. Today with Putin, that's not really the case. You know, if you are a Ukrainian government leader and somebody's talking about federation for the Donbass or federation future for, in the future for Crimea uh, or for Transnistria, immediately that smacks of uh, Russia trying to reach over the border into the, the neighboring uh, countries. Uh, so as long as you have sort of an expansionist or revisionist government in, in Moscow, it's gonna be very hard for anybody in the, uh, the, the neighboring countries to accept a federal solution on a border that could theoretically be subject to, to intervention or influence, I think. Uh, yeah, so 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 that that's that's how I would think about that. Great. Uh, next question from Rob and Poppy. What ideas about federalism would you say are relevant for groups or groups of countries or different groups becoming federalist states? It's it's a it's a very good question. I think uh, that that applies, you know, also to the American and some of the Western examples. Um, the, the the big point for the people in Russia in 1917 is that you should have federalism not just in, in terms of the law, but that there should be some uh, balance in terms of different regions having the ability to regulate their own economic uh, affairs and, and, and really to have self-determination in a material sense. Uh, I think uh, absolutely in, you know, in Russia today, you have a federal system uh, in form, even though the state is very centralized in, in practice. Uh, so the challenge there, I think, is um, you know, balancing between the needs of the central government or the, the biggest, most powerful unit in the federation and the, the outlying ones. Um, I, I would say that for me today, in the post-colonial context too, the, the, the economic aspect of self-determination is still as important as just the legal side. Uh, so I do think that needs to, to work. And it's interesting in the United States, right? Because we have different degrees of development in different regions. Certain states resent the federal government or the federal government owning a lot of land. Uh, so that discussion has to be part of it as well, uh, in addition to just the ideas and the, the, legal, the legal side, I would say. Excellent. Um, next question from William Pomerantz, director of the Kennan Institute. Did the Federalists in 1917 think that Russia required a national constitution to unify the nation? Or like Yeltsin in 1993, did they perceive mm. a series of treaties to unify the nation? It's, it's a very good question, I think, from, from, from Will. Uh, my understanding is that in a lot of the programmatic statements and the Congress resolutions, the idea was that there would be a common federal constitution and that the different uh, territories, no matter how big or small, would occupy a juridically equal place within that system, whether it's Ukraine or Georgia or, or parts of Central Asia. Um, so, so they were frequently outlining what the separation of powers would be. And a lot of the time it is uh, trade relations, foreign policy, railroads, weights and measures, uh, a common set of uh, uh, rights for all citizens under the constitution that would be vested in the central authority in Petrograd. But really there would be different constituent assemblies in each individual uh, uh, territory that would decide their own internal uh, rights. So it would be more that the center would uh, recognize the, the rights of the outlying territories to decide their internal affairs as long as they don't flagrantly violate the, the shared uh, constitutional freedoms of, of citizens. Uh, so it was, I think, supposed to be um, almost, it's uniform in their recognition of the autonomy of the different units, but then there would be a lot of room for different uh, choices within those constituent regions, almost like it is for the, the American states. Great. Next question from Hiroki Nakanishi. Could we see a whole process of centralization and decentralization processes of the Federation, specifically the decentralization process as a path to the CIS? It's an interesting uh, question, definitely. Um, the, the way that I'm interpreting it is that in, uh, in Russian history, traditionally, you do have kind of a back and forth or a dialogic uh, tension between centralizing and decentralizing uh, tendencies. Uh, I mean, certainly, I, I think back uh, to the predecessor of the CIS, to Gorbachev's idea of a Soviet confederation uh, that he was thinking about in the late 80s and, and early 90s. Uh, and, that, and that context is interesting because Gorbachev actually was uh, going back to the original ideas um, that, that Lenin and Stalin at least paid lip service to in the beginning, that the different republics were equal to the Russian Republic, and they, they, it was supposed to be a, a genuine federation. Uh, as soon as Gorbachev uh, right, allowed non-communist political parties to agitate in the borderlands, uh, 
Uh, that opened the way for the different republics to change their, their political systems and their economic systems as well. Uh, so I see with Gorbachev, especially in the, the um, idea of a Soviet confederation that later turns into the CIS under Yeltsin, almost as being an attempt at returning to or trying to um, redeem the original uh, ideas of, of, of Russian federalism in 1917. Uh, so I do see a, cont a continuity there, and I hope I answered the question uh, uh, fully. Uh, but with the CIS or the Eurasian, Eurasian Union today, uh, I mean, you know, clearly Russia is the, the, the leading power there, so it is different. But I think in the late 80s, early 90s, there was at least a, a glimmer of maybe returning to those projects from 1917, 1918. Great. Next question from Marcus Holman, Research Department Coordinator, New Strategy Center in Romania. How did the Federalist Movement manifest itself in the Crimean Peninsula more specifically? Hmm. This is a, a really interesting point because uh, the Central Rada actually started to claim Crimea, even though, again, it was heavily ethnically called eth Tarida Gubernia. Uh, so the Central Rada actually saw it as, as, uh, as part of the Ukrainian uh, territorial uh, fold. I think uh, as we saw with the sort of the Donbass region, though, in 1917-1918, uh, when Lenin tries to create a, a Ukrainian Soviet Republic uh, that would include the Donbass, uh, the, the, some of the ethnically Russian workers try to pull away and create this uh, Donetsk Krivoyrog Republic that would be separate. And that's kind of a, an antecedent to, to what's now the, the Novorossiya uh, movement. I believe, though, the, the Bolsheviks ultimately create um, a separate autonomous republic for Crimea within Russia uh, at first, an ASSR. That later gets joined to Ukraine in uh, 1954, when Khrushchev is celebrating the, the 300th anniversary of the uh, uh, russo cossack Union of Pereyasov. Uh, so if I remember correctly, they do create an autonomous republic for Crimea uh, early on in the, in the Bolshevik uh, federal project uh, within the Russian Republic. But, but the Tatars want to have their own Tatar autonomy there, and they do consider it to be they a Tatar territory. Be a Tatar territory. Oh, excellent, great. Um, next question, Michael Key, State Department. Did the roots of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, which seem to have been resolved last week, emerge in this federalization project? Another, yeah, an important point, uh, just because of what's happening at that time with the Armenian genocide, right, and uh, the, the, around 1916, 1917, uh, I think that really did um, uh, make the relations between the uh, Azeris and the Armenians quite difficult, uh, you know, very difficult, even though they had been having some clashes within the Russian Empire uh, earlier. Um, I think there was an attempt to remedy it uh, in, in early 1918 with this Caucasian Confederation with Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Uh, but because of the tensions between specifically the Armenians and, and, and uh, the, uh, the Azeris and also the Georgians having a very strong Menshevik movement, that does fall apart, fall apart very quickly. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, certainly it's it's more a matter of World War One and the, the genocide, I think, that sets the tension um, in, in motion. The actual choice, though, of creating Nagorno-Karabakh as a, as a, as a region, um, that is actually Stalin's creation in the 20s and 30s. He tries to carve out that area as an autonomous region, and uh, that's, that, that, that is uh, the root of it. So it's, it's more Stalin's drawing of the, the federal units within the Soviet Union than, than the ideas of 1917 that create the, the lines on the map that lead to that. Mm -hmm. um, next question from Rafina Panishi. Historically, how has the feder federation process, either centralization or decentralization, could mm -hmm. be easily or with forces? Are any written or written rules that are preceding the federation shall be peacefully? It's, it's a really good question, I think, um, in no small part because a lot of the time federations are created by force, even though federation implies maybe a more peaceful or, or lateral arrangement among the different groups involved. Uh, if you think about German reunification, for instance, in the 1860s, 1870s, it was Prussia that was the leading uh, state and that created a federation that was really organized with, with Prussia as the leading power. Uh, in the Soviet case, of course, it is you know Central European Russia that that brings the borderlands back under its control. So by no means do do federations always have to be generated in a in a peaceful way. Uh, if you look at the American example too, right, the the southern states secede to maintain their slave economy, and it's through a war that the the northern states uh, re reorganize the uh, the terms of the federalist uh, the, the federation. Um, I think uh, you know the the context of the American Revolution too. That's a case in which a, a war 
provides the impetus for the different colonies to come together. So I think that's a very good point uh, that actually, even though uh, federalism is usually conceived as a peaceful alternative to empire or a non-exploitative alternative to empire, the way that it actually has taken place historically on the world map has been through uh, conquest. And I would say too, if you look at you know Canada, Australia, uh, South Africa with the indigenous non-European populations, uh, they don't get equal say in the federation. They're put on reservations or altogether eliminated. Um, so absolutely, that's a very good point that federations historically have been based on coercive models of organization, even if they've been conceived uh, differently. Well, we are, we're about at time here. Maybe we've got one final question that's come up and, and this would maybe be a good closing question if you can mm. do it in like a minute, 90 seconds. Sure. Michael Key's State Department. I'm wondering if you see any similarities between what you see during this time period and what's happening today. That is the tension between globalist versus nationalists and nationalists. The emergence of game changing technology and the global state that promotes immigration. It's a, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, the, the way that I frame the project is that uh, even though you have federalist thought developing in the 19th century uh, in, in, in Ukraine and, and uh, other parts of the Russian empire, it really is the context of industrialization, uh, which we could maybe compare to some of the, the development of, of telecommunications technology today or the internet as being a disruptive technological force. Uh, industrialization is what leads to the to the formation of large scale political parties uh, in the late Russian Empire uh, by by you know 1905 or 1917 or labor movements. So um, these these federalist uh, models they're actually responding to globalizing influences and they're asking the question well how do you negotiate between local or national self determination and forces of global and and supranational uh, integration and their like really interesting idea is that under industrialization, you have an increasingly integrated global economy at the same time as you have individual national or regional economies crystallizing. So federalism by dividing powers is a political uh, a system that actually corresponds to the layered uh, realities of, of, of um, what we could describe as this kind of first globalization uh, with 19th and early 20th century industrialization. So I think they're trying to reconcile these, these integrative processes with different forms of national or regional peculiarity. Well, that's great. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I know we've got a couple more questions popping up, but we are going to have to wrap up. Marcel, that was a fantastic, a comprehensive presentation. And Russian president. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks very much. And if you uh, want to email a question, feel free to do that. My email address you can find online if you uh, uh, look for it. Uh, so uh, th thank you, Jennifer, though, and uh, for, for, for the comments and, and the introduction. And thank you, everybody, for the, the excellent discussion. And I hope I'll meet more of you face to face in the future when uh, as, as, as this is moving forward. So thanks for that. Thank you.